So we're going to go through an absolute dumpster fire of an article, something that is purely like it's a it pushing a political agenda, something that is incredibly biased, something that is factually untrue. A lot of what they say is completely false and is attacking their competition. They're basically saying these people are saying things and they're beating us. So we're going to ban them or no, we're not going to ban them. We recommend you ban them is what they're saying. And this is by The Guardian, too. Like this is a big name media organization. This is like the LA Times, the New York Times, big company. Um, all the are like big. Um, so it's it's absolutely awful that this terrible, horrible article is coming out. And it's not like it's it's just a poorly written article that is pushing atrocious things. And that's why we're gonna go through it line by line, because that's what I do in the article audit series. And normally I go after like smaller sites like this. There's actually a Mother Jones article which is even worse than this one. Uh, but the fact that this is put on such a big article or on such a big newspaper outlet, it's like, this is, wow, um, pure pushing an agenda using falsehoods. But yeah, we'll go through it. Um, it says, YouTube's alternative influence network bre breeds right-wing radicalization report finds. Study blames social media sites, network of scholars, media pundits, and internet celebrities who unite to promote far-right politics. Now, notice what they're saying. They're talking about the alternative influence network, which they are saying... It's a bunch of people that come together to promote far-right politics. That, that right there is immediately false. Because they even go through and they say, like, some of these people aren't far-right. So right off the bat, like, their, their subtitle or whatever is completely false. Um, and the, the alternative influence network, what they mean by that is the alternative media, basically. They mean everyone that's not mainstream. So Because right now you have two different groups of, like, media. You have the mainstream media and you have the alternative media. The mainstream media is the big name news sites, the big name like Fox, CNN, MSNBC, um, The Guardian, The Independent, uh, or I guess it's just independent. Um, again, New York Times, all these big sites were basically like, if you want to become big, you have to go through them. These are the people that made it big. And it's like, if you, and these people want to stay big and that's fine. Like, I get that. It's, it's nothing but competition, just like any other industry where you have those at the top that want to stay up top and you have those at the bottom who want to become the top. And again, there's nothing wrong with either side wanting to beat the other. But where it becomes awful is when they say, well, is when they start going for special fa favors, rent-seeking behavior, where those at the top of an industry lobby government and lobby and put all kinds of political pressure on organizations to keep them at the top and give them an unfair advantage. And that's essentially what's what's happened in a lot of sites with organizations getting like public funding and stuff like that. But yeah, so when, so keep in mind that when they talk about the alternative influence network, that's the topic of this article. They are talking about um, basically non-mainstream. Like it, it, they're not talking about a certain group, a ideological group. They're just talking about non-mainstream and people that rely on YouTube for the to to push their views. So YouTube provides a breeding ground for far-right radicalization, where people interested in conservative and libertarian ideas are quickly exposed to white national ones, according to a report from Data and Society. And I will note that they talk about conservative and libertarian ideas. I mean, as you'll see later on, it's a lot more people than just that. And granted, it's mainly conservative and libertarian, because if you're not conservative or libertarian, you go to the big name media sources because they'll publish you. And it's rather easy to get published because there's a bias towards you. At least compared to, again, compared to conservative and libertarian people. So obviously, the the group with the least popular or the least mainstream views are going to be alternative. And that, like that's just no surprise there. But people are saying they're quickly exposed, exposed to white national ones, according to a report. Although YouTube's recommendation algorithms are partly to blame. I mean, YouTube's algor or algorithms are atrocious in some respects and pretty good in other respects. I mean, they basically recommend what you want to watch. Like... If you watch something, they'll recommend you other videos with the same topic and by that same creator. Like, that's basically the best way to do it, as far as I can tell. Uh, the problem is fun fundamentally linked to the social network of political influencers on the platform and how, like other YouTube influencers, they invite one another on their shows. So notice what they're saying here automatically is that's, that the problem here with this alternative influence network of, as they say, 65 scholars, media pundits, and internet celebrities promoting a range of right-wing political positions from mainstream conservatism to avert white nationalism. So once again, some of the people they even mention specifically are not right-wing. In fact, they're left-wing. They're actually pretty far left-wing, some of the people they mention. And they invite one another, peop one another on their shows. Isn't that what you want? Because if we were to map out like mainstream media, for example, like the, because again, like there's a dichotomy here. There's mainstream and there's alternative. This is not talking about like they call it alternative influence network. I think just to come up with another name, but what they're really talking about is alternative media. Period. Like as opposed to the mainstream. 
Um, but they're saying they invite one another on their shows. And it's like, isn't that what you want? Isn't that what's ideal? Isn't that what you would want in a free, ideal society where the media constantly talks to one another? They discuss things with one another in public, of course. We're not talking about collusion behind closed doors, but we're saying, don't you want people to talk to one another? People with different ideas and opinions to talk to one another? Because imagine if you portrayed, if you took, like, later on they have a chart where they connect to everyone that's been talking to one another. Wouldn't you want people to talk to one another in a mainstream show? Because you ma if you map out mainstream, you'll have a big chunk of right-wing people and a big chunk of left-wing people and certain people in the middle who cross back and forth. But for the most part, you're going to have two big polarized groups because the right-wing people talk to the right-wing people, the left-wing people talk to the left-wing people, and that's about it. The only reason, like, again, if you're a left-winger going on Bill O'Reilly's show or Sean Hannity's show, it's not to discuss ideas. It's because you're... Like, it's it's because the person with the show, like, Hannity's going to have a left-wing guy on to say, look at this left-winger and look at why he's stupid. And the left-winger is going to have a right-winger on the show to say, look at this right-winger and look at how stupid they are. It's not to have a genuine discussion. It's because, quick, I need a right-winger with with um, someone that actually believes these views that I'm going to talk about why they're bad. I need someone on. And that's essentially what they do. So wouldn't you want a bunch of people that disagree with each other to talk to one another? And that's what they do. Like, they don't just talk... They have debates, they have discussions, and often it's very, there. there's all kinds of debates. Like, it's not too often that people attack one another, or it's not too often that people have one another on their shows, and they're just like, yeah, your ideas are right, your ideas are right, your ideas are right. I mean, certainly when they cover a, a common topic, yeah, but it's constant debate. Um, they are broadly united by their reactionary position and opposition to feminism, social justice, and left-wing politics and present themselves as, as an underdog alternative to the mainstream media. Yeah, it is. Like, it is an alternative. It's not that they pre present themselves as that. It's that if you don't want mainstream opinion, this is where you go. This is the only alternative because it is the, uh, the alternative. It's a, it's a collection of every other alternative together. And these people talk to one another, and that's great. Uh, but why are they opposed to feminism disproportionately? Well, because the mainstream is disproportionately like approval of feminism. So obviously, like if you're approving of feminism, you have the mainstream shows. If you disapprove of feminism, you can't get on the mainstream shows. So they're going to go their own way. They're going to start their own thing. They're opposed to social justice and left-wing politics. Again, that's because the mainstream is disproportionately in favor of that. Therefore, if you're someone starting out, you're, you're like it, you'd be much preferable to go the mainstream route because that's like the that's the easiest way to make it big though if your opinions are contrary to those or like outside the overton window of mainstream media you're gonna have to go the alternate route and that's what happens like people talk about how the alternative media has a disproportionate set of ideas like some ideas are disproportionately represented but yeah that's because the mainstream views on the opposite end are disproportionately represented Oh, yeah, discussing images of the alt-right or white supremacism um, often conjures a sense of the dark corners of the internet, states the report. Yeah. In fact, much extremist content is happening front and center, easily accessible in platforms like YouTube, publicly endorsed by well-resourced individuals, and interfacing directly with mainstream culture. Well, not really. I mean, in a sense, they're directly interfering, but, I mean, who name, name, name white nationalists. Like, how many people watching this video that are not part of this alternative community can name white nationalists they can name richard spencer they can name david duke that's about it <laughs> that's about it david duke's popular because he's been around for decades as and involved in the kkk richard spencer the only reason he's popular is because he got punched <laughs> and the media picked up on it and they were like oh this guy's right or this guy's a white nationalist and he's their token white nationalist like richard spencer's not very well respected among this community <laughs> he's really not like he he's richard spencer is the token guy like he's the token or uh, white nationalist guy that goes on mainstream media and a lot of people don't like richard spencer for that reason that he goes on mainstream media because like richard spencer really is not that popular and that's the thing like if he had never gotten punched and if the media had never invited him on their shows nobody would know who richard spencer is <laughs> like he'd, he'd be so incredibly unpopular and he's still relatively unpopular. It's like, even with all that influence, like, people know his name, but how many people actually pay attention to what he says? How many people actually take him seriously? Not that many. Like, granted, it's not, it, it's a non, it's not a zero, it's not zero. Like, there are certainly people that take him seriously, but it's not that many. It's really not that many. Um, but at the mainstream end of the network are people such as Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, and Dave Rubin. Again, Ben Shapiro, right wing, mainstream, Jordan Peterson, I guess he's right wing. 
or at least he's appreciated by the right wing. And the odd thing is white nationalists hate this guy. Like white nationalists do not like Jordan Peterson. So what you're saying at this network, at the, in the if you're talking about alternative media, the alternative influence network, the people at the or the alt right, the white nationalist people hate these guys. Ben Shapiro is Jewish. They don't like Ben Shapiro at all. Dave Rubin, they don't really like Dave Rubin because he's Jewish too. <laughs> And he's gay. <laughs> like, those are two things that the white nationalists really don't like. So you've named the mainstream people in this alternative network, or the people in this alternative network that are closest to the mainstream, and they're all disliked by, like, the far right. Uh, so what you're saying is, in this... <laughs> so what you're saying is, in this group of, like, radical... of the alternative, the most popular people are disliked by the white nationalists. It's like, isn't that good? Isn't that what you want? Because in this sense, everyone has it kind of fairly. Like, obviously, there are some people that are targeted more than others and are banned off YouTube and their content shadow banned and restricted and all that. But in this sense, everyone talks to one another. Or at least, like, most people talk to most people. And in a sense, like, everyone is at least two or three degrees of separation from everyone else. But what that means is, I mean, what does that mean? That means that, um, like, the best ideas have won. That's what that means. Like, it means that the best ideas, one, <laughs> um, that you have the, 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 like the white nationalist people are not making it, are not making it big. In fact, the people that the white nationalists hate are the ones making it big. Um, at the other end are white nationalists such as Richard Spencer and Colin Robertson. Again, at the other end, meaning the less popular people are Richard Spencer and Millennial Woes, white nationalist people. So, in this in this area where everyone talks to one another and everyone is exposed to everyone idea everyone's ideas the least popular people are the white nationalists and that's great that's what you want like we're saying the best ideas win here again millennial woes richard spencer like i know who these people are because i watch not because i watch their channels but because i watch other people's channels that have talked about them or had them on or debated them and i don't talk to these people like i don't like these people i think they're wrong <laughs> i somehow survived this and most people have survived this uh, while the mainstream members of the group typically don't subscribe to all right or white nationalist ideals, there you go. <laughs> like, there you go, as I just said already. They do host those who do under very friendly terms. Very, not really, under, I wouldn't even say friendly. It's just of, it's just in good faith is what I would say. Like, and that's great. That's what you want. You want, you don't want to have people like, you don't want to have, pe uh, to have um, mainstream people like talking like friendly and super friends with all these other atrocious views, what you want is in good faith. And that's what it is for the most part. Like a lot of these people, they talk to one another in good faith. And there are certain people like white nationalists can be right. Like certain white nationalists can be right on one issue that isn't white nationalism. And in that sense, sure, like they might be an expert in one other topic. And for that reason, they'll, they'll be on someone else's show to talk about that. Like white nationalists, probably pretty accurate on feminism and <laughs> pretty pretty accurate on social justice warriors and stuff like that but on white nationalism not so much so the topic really depends and of course like again they're talking to one another but are they are they doing it on very friendly terms not really they're doing it on at least in good faith but often they're debating they're debunking other people's ideas they're going on about how they're wrong they're debating and that's what you want and again the, the white nationalists are not that popular <laughs> like they've pretty much lost they have these conversations where, pe where really openly racist ideas are getting thrown around as if they are perfectly normal, said Rebecca Lewis, the author of the report. This amplifies these ideas. I disagree. I disagree. Again, we haven't gotten to the list yet, to the graph, which looks like just uh, like, how paranoid do you have to be to make a graph like that? Um, I, I watch most of these people. And honestly, like openly racist ideas are not common. And, I mean, they're brought up a lot, but often to debunk. Like, the vast majority of, it, of of these topics, when they're brought up, like, the vast majority of times that white nationalist topics are brought up is to debunk them and say why they're wrong. Like, it's not that common. But, of course, I imagine it's because this Rebecca Lewis person thinks that all kinds of things that aren't actually racist are racist. That's probably where she's going wrong, and that she's not actually addressed these ideas. She's not actually looked at them. She's, looked, she's glanced at them. Said, th thought they were scary and then called them racist, basically. And we can tell that from her next paragraph where she says, she cites the example of Dave Rubin hosting Canadian right-wing influencer Stefan Molyneux, who openly promotes scientific racism and advocates for the main men's rights movement. So again, advocates for the men's rights movement. I'm concerned as to how that has to do with anything, how that has to do with racism or anything, because, I mean, I have nothing against the men's rights movement. I'm not part of it, but I have nothing against it. And I have no idea why that's considered like a radical view. Like, the fact that 
that is considered a radical view in this article. It makes me think that, like, that proves your point right there, how men's rights is not mainstream, but, but uh, women's rights is mainstream. It's like, I get why that would be a scenario, like, half a century ago, but now, like, again, that shows why the men's rights movement is so popular in alternative media, because it's not popular in mainstream. But again, the, the, the elephant of the room of this paragraph here, the scientific racism thing, false. He has not promoted scientific racism in the slightest. And the reason I know that, and the reason I know that Rebecca Lewis probably knows that, either, or either she doesn't know it, in which case she has not done even the slightest amount of research, or she does know it, and she lied anyway. The reason I know she's she's either uh, either hasn't done the research or is aware, and I know it's not that just that she's misconstrued things, is because a lot of these topics you can misconstrue. Like, I imagine I'd sympathize with people. I, I at least understand when people hear about these ideas and they might think, oh, that sounds racist. Like, I can understand that. And these people understand it as well. The people talking about these ideas understand it as well. That is why they constantly bring up, this is not racist and here is why. They go through the whole logic of it and they say, this is why it's not racist. In fact, it is anti-racist, of anything. In fact, only racists would accept this if, if like, would accept this as... Um, would treat this as racist kind of thing where the topics themselves are not racist because they address it a lot in fact the very interview that she's talking about where david rubin hosts stefan molly david rubin's rather critical i mean david rubin if you haven't watched the show is generally very like like he's very accepting very welcoming to his guests he treats his guests very nicely he doesn't do a lot of pushback like he will not he will not start raising his voice and fighting with people like hannity or bill o'reilly would he just says he just talks about their views and if he can think of some, uh, any, if he can think of the biggest opposition to their views, that's what he'll do. Like, if Stefan, when Stefan Molyneux brings up the race and IQ thing, Dave Rubin asks the appropriate questions of like, why isn't this racist? Why isn't this like, these are the accusations people have said against you? What do you think about them? They've addressed all this. It's not openly racist because the thing is, the whole problem with this debate here about the whole scientific racism thing is what is happening is. We've done research like this is accepted. This is rather accepted among like actual psychologists, actual scientists. Like as I think the scientists like are like, yeah, this is probably true. <laughs> like whereas the political pundits and that are all having this debate on how dare you say that this is debunk science and all that in, in the, the field of psychology and genetics and evolutionary psychology and all that. It's relatively accepted <laughs> like and it's not racist. But what they're saying is that if you take. Actually, they'll, they'll cover it next in the bat and in the next paragraph. Ruben asked Molyneux to describe his position on the link between race and IQ, where he cites research that has shown different races have different average IQ results. Molyneux believes that shows this this shows that intelligence of different race, races is genetic rather than environmental, something that's shown time and time again to be bad science. Well, it's not bad science. That's the thing. Like, there are certain people that say race doesn't exist, which is bad science. Um, there's all kinds of different things they bring up, but. This is not bad science. And I'll just explain it very briefly because this is a topic like I don't cover that much just because I'll admit it is a very uncomfortable topic. Um, but basically, the, the what it all comes down to is what happens is we, we understand, like I'm assuming everyone watching this like at least supports the idea of evolution. That if you take two different groups, two different species, separate them by a geographical barrier and submit them to two different environments where the like the environments are different there's different environmental pressures for certain traits you separate them for thousands and thousands and thousands of years there will be differences in fact if you do, do it for tens and tens of thousands of years you can have two different species entirely because there's there's such they have grown into like their differences are so extreme that they can no longer breed but what really happens is they say you take two groups of people to some people from europe some people from Africa, some people from Asia, you separate them for thousands, thousands, thousands of years, you're going to have slight differences. And that, like, that's, that's far, and IQ is one of them, basically, where IQ is more pressured by colder environments than warmer environments, because they have to be able to, like, IQ is correlated with delaying gratification, and in a, an environment that's constantly summer, where you can constantly grow food, that's not, there's not as much pressure for that. In the winter, or environments with harsh winters, yes. Like the people with low IQ that can't save food for winter, they die off. People that learn to save for winter, that's a pressure for higher IQ. Now it's like, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean much in daily life. <laughs> the, the evidence, the science basically says that racism is not a good thing. Like this race and IQ link says that you cannot judge people based on race. You cannot judge people's IQ based on race. You cannot judge... Um, all kinds of things based on race. You just can't do it because the differences are not that great. 
Like, it, there are small differences. We're talking about averages here. We're talking about statistical trends, averages. And what the, um, what the science basically says is, again, in daily life, it, it hurts to be racist. If you're a company, because what they're saying is, yes, if you take the average person in the black population, their IQ is on average lower than the average person in the white population kind of thing. It's all average. But if I were to say start a company and base it off of racism and say, okay, well, because of this, I'm going to say that um, I'm not going to hire any black people. It wouldn't work because I'd be taking a significantly, a significant portion of intelligent people, like the black population of intelligent people, and I'd be kicking them out immediately. It wouldn't work. It's not good. <laughs> like it, racism basically doesn't work because it's against science. And this, what he's saying here is not racist at all. Because again, the only part that it really works, the, or the only, the only reason we talk about this at all, is because um, we can disprove parity. And this is something that Thomas Sowell talks about a lot, especially in Civil Rights Rhetoric Reality. Short book, 100 pages, highly recommend. He basically just says, like, you can't prove parity. Like, parity will not work. And if you take a group of people, if you were to somehow create a world without any racism at all, where nobody was racist, and you gave them all total freedom, there was no barriers to race at all, you would not have equality. You would not see whatever, black po the black population, I think it's 13% of the United States. You would not have the black population being 13% of one industry and another industry. And it would not be equal across all bounds. You would have certain barriers. That's the name of the, like, with men, uh, male and female, talking about differences in gender. You would not have parity because they're different. Doesn't mean one's better than the other. Like, that's the thing. It doesn't mean that one's better than the other. Think about, that's the thing with men and women. People are saying men and women are equal in every way. Now, in equal in morality, like, that, that's where, uh, that's actually, that's, that's a very good point. Because people mess up equality. Equality of, like, biology and equality of rights. Now, does everyone deserve every, does everyone deserve equal rights regardless of race? Yes, no one's disputing that. Except the white nationalists, of course. But um, even the people that talk about the race and IQ stuff, everyone deserves equal rights. And they're not against that. They're all for that, which is great. They're just saying that if you give everyone equal rights, there won't be parity. And that's why. And when people say this is due to discrimination, it's like, no, you're going after the wrong problem. In fact, you're making the problem worse. But that's that whole thing. That's a whole different topic. But yeah, civil rights recommend or civil rights rhetoric or reality. That's a very good book because he brings up the difference. He brings up the false dichotomy because people seem to believe, like this writer here, probably. They seem to believe that either groups are exactly the same biologically or one is superior to the other. That's the belief that like either everyone is exactly the same or some people are superior to others. And that's a false dichotomy. That's not the case. Because again, the best example is men and women. Like if you look at a man and you look at a woman, you can tell which is which. Pretty obviously. Like it's pretty evident uh, among the vast majority of people. They're obviously different in biology. Is one better than the other? No. It's like saying, what's better, a doctor or an engineer? They're two very different fields. They're very two different. They're two very different career paths. Doctor and engineer, which is more important? <laughs> it's a bad. It's a dumb question. Like the question itself is fundamentally flawed because they're both important. They just do two different things. Like that's the big question. It's like you can admit that there are differences, and not say that one is superior to the other. It's the same thing. Like I just explained with career. Like what's more important, a teacher or an engineer? Well. You need the teacher, <laughs> like an, an, an engineering teacher or the engineer. Well, you need the teacher to teach more engineers, but you need the engineer to actually do the thing. Like they're both very important and they're both different. It's a, it's a, that's the problem with asking the question. Like just because people are different doesn't mean one is superior to the other. And that I think is the very, I think, I think that is the least racist position. Because when people say the race and IQ thing and the differences in gender and all that don't exist, what they're saying is if it does exist, then I must be racist. It's like no, it, it does exist, and I'm not racist, so <laughs> it's that that that's the whole thing. A bit of a tangent there, but that's explaining that. Um, although Rubin doesn't endorse these views, he doesn't challenge them in any substantive way, and appears to take his words at face value. I mean, that's what Rubin does. Like you can critique, you can like it, you can dislike it, but I kind of appreciate that. That's what Rubin does. He brings people on, he talks to them very nicely, he asks some follow up questions, some questions like some people would disagree with you on this. Can you explain that? I think it's a very great way of talking to people. Um, Ruben, is there evidence it's genetic? Molyneux, yes. Uh, Ruben, genetic in what regard? I mean, if we took the brain of a 25-year-old black man and the brain of a 25-year-old white man, what is it that they are doing that, Molyneux? They are different sizes, yes. I mean, I don't know if that's true. I'm assuming that's true, but on average, yes. Again, they, we're talking about averages here. That's what people misunderstand. That's that's the important question here, averages. It's only a statistical average. 
and that's fine. <laughs> like, it's it's not enough of a difference to justify racism in any way. It's just like, yeah, you'll have averages. Uh, th this type of scientific racism has been used to justify racial hierarchies and oppression for centuries, centuries, states the report. By letting him speak without providing a legitimate and robust counterargument, Rubin provides a free platform for white supremacist ideology on his channel. Well, the nice thing is Rubin has yet to have a single white supremacist on, white supremacist on his channel. Like, he hasn't had a single one. <laughs> and that, that's what I find interesting. Now, Rubin, one of, like you said earlier, one of the biggest parts of this um, alternative influence network has never had a single white nationalist on his channel. <laughs> what does that say? Or a single white supremacist on this channel. Um, but here's the graph right here. The Alternative Influence Network on YouTube, which, have you ever seen that meme of um, Charlie from It's Always Sunny in Philly? Like being a conspiracy theorist, if I actually, you don't even have to know the meme, but the people that put all these different things on a board. Like, oh, they have all these different things on a board, newspaper clippings, and here and here and here. And then they have connections. They have yarn and um, thumbtacks to connect them all, to connect the dots. Like, that's what you do in TV if you want to make someone paranoid. <laughs> what does this look like right here? Uh, I think it's paranoia because all of this is true, but what does it prove? Like, they're proving that it's somehow, like, something terrible. It's not. But um, this is a very important graph here that I think we should go through. So this is the so-called alternative influence network. And they're saying is subject to white nationalism and all that. And Okay, so what they do is they, they have the biggest blocks. It's kind of hard to see in the picture. But they have the biggest blocks here. See if I can actually... Oh, I may have just ruined everything. <laughs> I may have just ruined everything. But it'll come up in a second. But essentially what it's saying is, um, if you look at the, the biggest people in the group, like the biggest, most well-known people, see if I can get it to come up. There we go. I don't know what just happened there. But yeah, let's see if we can zoom in. No, I can't. Oh, well. But anyway, we'll go back to this. Uh, oh, there we go. It did zoom in. Cool. <laughs> Sorry about that. But um, you take the biggest people here because um, the people with the biggest squares have the biggest influence. So you take who do we got? Millennial Woes. That guy's a white nationalist. I would argue that he doesn't have that big of an influence because I watch a lot of these people and I've seen one conversation with them. So I think that's fundamentally flawed in that aspect because he's not that big of a channel, honestly. Um, I would do it by YouTube subscribers. But yeah, it says right here, the size, the size of nodes are determined by the number of other influencers with whom they connect. Okay, so that talks about how like well-known they are, but it doesn't talk about how well-known their ideas are. Or really how much influence they have in the network. It just talks about who they talk about. But yeah, Millennial Woes, I'll, granted, white nationalist. I don't watch his stuff. I don't think he's that popular, but this thing's saying he's popular, so we'll go with it. But who else we got? Andy Worski. Andy Worski is honestly like there, there's kind of a rise and fall of Andy Worski. He used to be kind of popular, not so much. But Andy Worski, if you don't know, hosts a debate channel. I'm pretty sure he's all right, but he hosts a debate channel. So like that's why he's well known here because he hosts a debate channel. He has all, he has all of these people on to debate about everything. Everyone's been on his show at least once. Like he had a really popular show for a while. Like and for a while, I mean like a few months. <laughs> it's not that much. But um, the reason he's big there because he has a debate channel. So again, like if I were to host a debate channel and be completely neutral and have everyone about everything, obviously would show I have the most influence. But he doesn't go on other people's channels, which I think is important to remember. He doesn't go on other people's channels. He just has his own channel. So anyone that doesn't follow him really doesn't know him. Um, he doesn't He's not. He doesn't guest appear on other people. But So two alt-right people, I'll grant you that. Uh, Carl Benjamin, completely anti-alt-right. <laughs> like, not alt-right in the slightest. In fact, I would argue it's the strongest force at the moment against the alt-right. Big influence. Stefan Molyneux, not alt-right. I know they tried to paint him as that. Not alt-right. Steven Crowder, not alt-right, even remotely. And now the weird thing is they did say earlier that the biggest, like, the biggest influence, the people with the biggest influence were Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro, and, um, and Dave Rubin. Um, Jordan Peterson here is the top left. I, you can't see my mouse, so I can't really zoom in. But Jordan Peterson, the top left, very small. <laughs> um, Dave Rubin, slightly down to the left, a bit bigger. I overall not that big on this graph. Ben Shapiro, I don't even see Ben Shapiro, to be honest. He's probably on this thing, but I don't see Ben Shapiro. So automatically, that makes me think, okay, like, you said the three biggest people are, are showing up small on this dot. So the, the, the premise here is fundamentally flawed, what you're trying to prove. 
Because you're saying how many connections they have, and sure, that might be important to know, but it doesn't show how big they are. It doesn't show how popular they are, how much influence they have. It just talks about, like, I guess how many other channels they go on. And it's 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 not accurate because, again, like Andy Orsky, he doesn't go on other people's channels, but he go he has a lot of people on his channels. That's why if you don't follow him, you're not really going to know much about him. If you don't follow, like, if, if you follow your content creators and you don't follow, like, how often um, they're on other shows, like, you're not going to get influenced. You're not going to be influenced by them. There, there's Ben Shapiro right below Dave Rubin. Again, very small dot on this. So the problem is this is like, it doesn't prove that much. It doesn't, it's it's um, re relatively inaccurate. Because if you were to go by subscriber count, well, what do we got? Um, who has a ton of subscribers? Carl Benjamin, ton of subscribers. Lauren Southern, Stefan Molyneux, ton of subscribers. Paul Joseph Watson here is relatively at the bottom. Like, geez, relatively well known. Over a million subscribers. Rather small on, on this graph. Uh, but then one other thing I want to look at with this graph. Okay, so you have people like Jared Taylor, Millennial Woes, Andy Worski, all right people. But then on this other graph, you have people like, again, Jordan Peterson, who I went through, who the all right hates, Joe Rogan, who as far as I know has never had like a white nationalist person on his show. I don't even know what he believes, honestly. Like, I don't even know. I can't even ascribe a specific ideology to him. Um, Who else we have? We have um people like Chris Reagan, who is just like, I mean, he's a political comedian, but he does more like comedy stuff, joke stuff. He's not like a, political ideologue that goes after stuff you also have destiny on here right next to lauren southern to the top right destiny left wing very left wing it's just that he's willing to debate pretty much everyone like he constantly brings up debate 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 you have destiny who is not like destiny is really left wing <laughs> like a super left wing and yet they put him on this list and saying oh he has something to do with everyone else like I guarantee you that every time Destiny talked to a lot of these people, or most of the time that Destiny talked to these people, it was to debate. It was to really debate and say why these ideas are wrong. So that's why this whole graph here is fundamentally like skewed. It doesn't tell you too much. Uh, members of the network frequently use a live debate format. Again, debate. <laughs> like that's a big part of that right there. Debate. The fact that they are constantly questioning their views. With multiple speakers arguing for hours on topics such as race, immigration, and feminism. Again, race. Like the all right people talk about that the most and to talk about race is not racist like you have to remember that the people that debunk racist claims are talking about race <laughs> the people that debunk racism are talking about race and like you can't say that debunking racism is a bad thing or i imagine you wouldn't say that um immigration that's a big topic like <laughs> it's, it's a big topic why wouldn't they talk about immigration and feminism of course another big topic this format is particularly challenging to moderate, relying on view to moderate. I'm assuming they mean moderates, relying on viewers reporting objectionable content during the live stream. Not sure what that means. Um, YouTube profits from these live debates through the super chat feature, which allows users to pay to have their comments highlighted during the stream, even if a channel fails to meet YouTube's advertiser-friendly content guidelines. Yes. So after the whole apocalypse, after people were losing all kinds of money, YouTube is losing so much money right now because they keep blocking ads on all these views or on all these channels. So they're hosting channels. They're paying to host these channels and these videos, but they're not getting paid for them. YouTube's losing a lot of money. So what they did was they introduced the Super Chat feature. And as far as I know, YouTube takes quite a bit of the Super Chat. Basically, yeah, I pay, and my comment shows at the top of a live stream. And that's like, I see, like, that's how they make money. Like, that's fine. I see nothing wrong with the Super Chat feature. Uh, but as a BuzzFeed investigation in May highlighted, these paid for comments are frequently used to spread hate, or spread hate speech. And again, Hate speech, like anyone that brings up hate speech, it's like, what is hate speech? Hate speech is anything you disagree with, is how I can tell it's defined. So when, when someone, whenever someone brings up hate speech, I just have to toss it out because it's such a subjective, undefinable term. I think this article's hate speech because this article's talking about like how bad it is that people are talking on the internet. Like how offensive do you think that is to people that enjoy discussing ideas? So it's, it's just a throwaway term. One of the challenges for YouTube is how careful the more extreme members of the network are to avoid breaking the platform's community guidelines. Even the most open white nationalists know how to stay just within the terms of service. You almost never hear them using racial slurs. They couch the language in a way that obscures its violent overtones, said Lewis. And again, she's, she's including people like Molyneux on this list. She's including people like that talk about race and IQ stuff that are not even remotely racist. Racist. They oppose white nationalism. In fact, the Mother Jones article, again, I admit that that's a different article. That's not this. The Mother Jones article even commented on the big debate between Richard Spencer and Sargon, which was on Andy Worski's channel, so there's a big coalition right there. 
the Mother Jones article was saying, yeah, they basically agreed that everyone on that show basically agreed that um that that white nationalism is a good thing. They they all agreed that whites are genetically superior to non whites, and it's like, did you even watch that? <laughs> that is not even remotely true. Saying that everyone agreed on that is kind of like saying, looking at the 2016 presidential debates, like between Trump and Hillary, and saying, yeah, they agreed on pretty much everything. Like, <laughs> it's not even remotely true. Uh, they also employ persuasion, persuasive influencer market, marketing techniques to increase their audiences and establish an alternative to mainstream news through memes, cross promotion, and search engine optimization. Yeah, just like everyone does. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. Everyone does that. Search queries for terms like social justice, liberal, and intersectionality will yield results from members of the network because they frequently use these terms in the titles of their videos. Yes, members of the network, which is, again, so incredibly diverse. You talk, like, let's go back to that. Notice how, like, when talking about diversity, again, we talked about politics, like, Chris Reagan, left wing, um, James Alsop, right wing, Tara McCarthy, right wing, like, white nationalist, I guess, or I don't even know if she's white nationalist, but, like, identity politics. Um, Tommy Wright, Robinson, center right, right wing, like, honestly, like, classical liberal, I guess I would say. Um, Jordan Peterson, right wing, but, yeah, I guess he's right wing, but hated by the far right. Blair White, right wing. Joe Rogan, I don't even know. Dave Rubin, kind of left wing. Dennis Prager, right wing. Ben Shapiro, right wing. Owen Benjamin, I guess right wing. Crowder's right wing. Um, I don't even know some of these other people. Uh, Molyneux. Like, again, he fits under the definition of right wing. So, yeah, a lot of right wing people. But then we get to Destiny, left wing. Jeff Holliday, I'm, I think he's left wing, actually. I'm pretty sure. Um, left wing. Like, Kraut and T. Kraut was known for going against the all right. I don't even know if he's right. I think he's left wing. But he was known for just going after the right, going after the far right. Um, Bunty King, I don't know much about him, but I'm pretty sure he's left wing. V, centrist, I think. Like, I'm making estimates here. Um, but all kinds of people that are like, like a lot of these people in this group, you have to remember, don't get along either. Like, this is a very diverse group. Um, both in Both in the sense of like, ethnicity and both in minorities and both in the sense of ideology uh these are the kinds of techniques used by brands makeup vloggers to capture people's attention only this time the product is political ideology well yeah that's the case with everything like this is no different from mainstream news <laughs> this is no different uh, youtube monetizes influence for everyone regardless of how harmful their belief systems are that's not true at all like look up the apocalypse everyone's hurt by this this affects like if you put out anything even remotely controversial you'll be hit hard You'll get demonetized. Uh, the platform and its parent company have allowed racist, misogynist, and harassing content to remain online, and in many cases to generate advertising revenue as long as it does not explicitly include slurs. Good. Like, that's good. Like, it includes racist, misogynist, and has harassing content. Or, not even harassing content. That's not even true. Racist and misogynist content online? Good. Like, thank God. Because I want a platform that allows these things. I want a platform dedicated to free speech that allows these things because if you remember racist content misogynist content is relatively unpopular on the internet like it's really not that popular as we went through all these people like if you look at subscriber count a lot of the alt-right people do not have that many subscribers they are not that popular they are not that influential like, they're just not that big and that's 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 what happens when you take all these people and you just say like here's here's an open platform go say your mind say what you want talk about things discuss things you'll find that the most popular channels as was already mentioned in the article ben shapiro dave rubin Jordan peterson are disliked by the alt-right greatly and in fact like dave rubin left wing jordan peterson kind of right wing um ben shapiro pretty right wing that's pretty like open diverse um pretty like a uh, big variety of views there but yeah, so the fact that you're complaining about this is scary. The fact that you're complaining that it's like people say things I disagree with and they shouldn't be allowed on the internet, because that's what this article really is. It's complaining about the, that, the fact that people can talk on the internet freely. And that is scary. Like, that's terrifying to, to be a, like that they're going after these people. Um, YouTube is an open platform where anyone can choose to post videos to a global audience subject to our community guidelines, which we enforce rigorously, said a YouTube spokeswoman. And on the left here it says, extremism pays. That's, this is another article I understand. Extremism pays. That's why Silicon Valley isn't shutting it down. They are shutting it down. Like, extremism doesn't pay. Alex Jones, which a lot of people would consider extremist. A lot of, like, I'm not saying, I don't think he's that extreme. He is extreme in some aspects, but not in terms of, like, far left or far right. Um... 
like they just shut him down <laughs> like to say that they're not shutting it down like they're, they're doing everything they can to shut it down without trying to get too many people angry because this is a very popular like these people are very well known the company has tightened the rules for which channels have access to monetization features and deploy machine learning technology to identify hate speech and comment features, the spokeswoman added. If a user is caught sending abusive super chats, the revenue received will be donated to charity instead of being split between YouTube and the channel's creator. Again, like, what is hate speech? Like, this is scary. Like, they're saying this is a good thing, but this is scary. The fact that, like, what is hate speech? It's just offensive content. Like, again, nobody can define hate speech other than it, sends, it tends to, for some reason, disproportionately affect normal right like mainstream like oh like non-hate speech things on on the right that's what's terrifying lewis argues that youtube and other platform content moderation policies need to factor in the influence of an account rather than just the content no when an anonymous account with four followers tweets a conspiracy it's very different from when alex jones posts the same exact conspiracy theory she notes yes and alex jones got shut down like so they're going after these people and that was awful like, they're doing what she wants here, and they're going after these people. And that is terrible. Like, remember that she, remember what the whole point of this article is, that they are complaining that people are allowed to say what they want on the internet. Like, that's, that's what it comes down to, that people are allowed to say what they want on the internet. And if you recall that the most radical views, the white nationalist views, the craziest views, like, the actual racist views are not that popular. They're relatively unpopular. And again, the non-racist, like, again, she said, this group, Jordan Peterson, Dave Rubin, I've said this like four times already, Jordan Peterson, David Rubin, um, Ben Shapiro, these people aren't hateful people. Even remotely, they're not even remotely hateful. And yet she's she's grouping them in with all these people and saying that they need to, like, that this is a problem somehow. YouTube issues awards to accounts when the content creator reaches 100,000, 1 million, or 10 million subscribers. At these milestones, the company also reviews the account to make sure they have not infringed copyright or violated YouTube's community guidelines. The vast majority of YouTube's moderation decisions are based on the content of videos. The exception to this rule is foreign terrorists. In these cases, YouTube refers to a list of individuals and organizations supplied by the government and will block them from creating channels regardless of whether these channels violate YouTube's community standards. Lewis promotes that YouTube should not consider not only reviewing the content of the channels identified in the report, but the people they host and what their guests say. YouTube is choosing to content to continue to endorse the content of these people who are delivering really harmful messages, she said. It would be an opportune time to remake their standards stricter for people that have that level of influence. No. Notice she's saying YouTube is endorsing these people. YouTube is by no means endorsing these people. Because what happens is, right, there's this big debate now on whether YouTube should be and other social media platforms should be considered a publisher or a platform. If YouTube is a platform, which it is, then that means that, like, they don't sift through stuff. Uh, obviously they would sift through like illegal stuff but as a platform platforms should not sift through information and say i like this stuff this gets published i don't like this this doesn't get published they shouldn't be going through like that and if they do that means they are a publisher not a platform if you're a publisher then that means that you're when you're putting out this information you're at least saying yes we put out this we accept that we are putting out this information and this is information we not specifically not, that the organization doesn't specifically endorse, but are comfortable putting out. When you're a platform, that means that everything that gets put on your platform, you are not responsible for. That like if you put it out there, that that's not your fault. Like it's an open platform, anyone can post anything. You don't endorse it. You don't like you're you're, you're neutral towards it. You may or may not have an opinion of it. And the fact that YouTube is a platform means they don't endorse anything on their platform like they uh, obvious uh, unless they actually like the company actually gets together and says yes this is a video we endorse um and the problem is if they decide to be a platform if they start getting more strict like this they will cease to be a platform and start being a publisher which means they are liable for everything posted and that's that's what people are confusing here oh that was it <laughs> um yeah, that's pretty much it. And the last thing is just uh, the Guardian saying, give us money. And no, that's why I have the Brave browser installed. That's why I have the ad block enabled for Brave. I recommend you just do so too. But yeah, that's the whole article. Sorry this video went so long. My throat actually hurts from because I have to talk loudly to overcome the voice or overcome background. Uh, but yeah, that's... No. <laughs> this is an absolute dumpster fire of, a, of, the art of an article. It's claiming, it's basically saying like, yeah, you have to crack down on these people. But as we have seen, as I have said repeatedly throughout this article, 
like this, the way YouTube works is the best ideas win. And that's what we've seen. That the white nationalist views are not nearly as popular as the as the uh, the actual decent views, the not, the least hateful views. Like Dave Rubin is not even remotely hateful. I think you can say that for sure. And he's one of the biggest voices on here. What does that say? Like I think that says a lot of good things. And the thing is, it's even more significant that you're saying all these people have connections, and yet the alt right channels still aren't that popular. Like sure they're gonna have some following, they're gonna have some audience, and there's nothing you can do about that other than just say why these videos are wrong. Like you, they're always going to have some audience that's always going to happen just like there are flat earthers out there like you're there are flat earthers on youtube that believe the earth is flat there's actually a surprisingly high number of them but it's like nobody cares like they're so they're still so insignificant that nobody cares so when people talk about like all, all these alt-right channels it's like you're, you're including all these other channels channels that aren't even remotely all right again of this group up here that they mentioned how many of these people are actually alt-right and how many of these people are anti-alt-right? We'll do this one more time, then I'll end the, the video by going through who's alt-right and who is specifically anti-alt-right. So, and of course, I don't know about all these people, but I, I can only do the ones I know. Like Tommy Robinson, against the alt-right. Tom McCarthy, alt-right. Millennial Woes, alt-right. Sticks Hexenhammer, anti-alt-right. Richard Spencer, alt-right. Worski, alt-right. Sympathetic, I guess. Kraut, anti-alt-right. Faith Goldie. Honestly, don't know. Um, Baked Alaska, I believe, is all right. Um, Chris Raygun, anti alt right. Um, Jordan Peterson, anti alt right. Um, that guy, T, I haven't watched his channel in a while, but I believe he's anti alt right because he's an ANCAP. Blair White, anti alt right. Joe Rogan, anti alt right. Dave Rubin, anti alt right. Dave Dennis Prager, anti alt right. Ben Shapiro, anti alt right. Owen Benjamin, against the alt right. Candace Owens, anti alt right. Steven Crowder, James Damore, Michael Knows, um, James O'Keefe, Andrew Cohen, all against the alt right. Um, Stefan Molyneux against the alt-right, Roaming Millennial against Mr. Medicare against Paul Watson against, Bunty King against, Milo against, um, Nick Fuentes alt-right, JF is alt-right, I think, V against, uh, Black Pigeon Speaks, I'm not going to say anything because I don't know for sure either way, um, Benjamin, or Sargon, anti-alt-right, uh, Tim Pool anti-alt-right, Some Black Guy, anti-alt-right, Jeff Holiday anti-alt-right, um, Destiny, very anti-alt-right, Lauren Southern, anti-alt-right but i guess like less opposed to them than other people is how i interpret it but still anti-alt-right i would say um but yeah like look, look when this is mostly against the alt-right most of these people are against the alt-right which would make me think that when they talk to alt-right people it's because they're debating them not because um not because they're like they're having a friendly chat and saying hey we're all we're both all right we both agree on everything no and I know this 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 writer would consider like people like Molyneux and Southern alt right, and it's like no, they're not. <laughs> they're both specifically anti alt right. They cover a lot of the same topics. But again, remember that Fox News and CNN cover a lot of the same topics. Doesn't mean they agree even remotely. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Let me know what you think in the comments. Sorry for such a long video. If you made it to the end, fantastic. But I just wanted to really dive into this article and how absolutely horrible it is because this is <laughs> awful. Uh, but yeah, let me know what you think in the comments. Like the video if you enjoyed. Subscribe for more. It really helps me out. And thanks for watching.